Let's read on to the next passage where Descartes says more about why science is good and how it can be good. Again, this is an important passage and it would be worth your while to pause the video, read the text in context, and get it into your mind, get your own response to it, and then come back to what I have to say about it. Now, the most important thing that's good about science is, again, something straightforward. It's useful in this life, which is opposed to the next life, say, getting into heaven. In order to understand this sentence, it's useful to remember that the words science and philosophy were synonyms in Descartes' day up until the 19th century. To do what we call science was simply to do natural philosophy. Now, Descartes wants to bring the world around to his useful knowledge, which is technology to produce tools for solving our problems in this life. And he wants society to take that in place of what it has now, which is called speculative philosophy. Now, speculative philosophy was typical of Europe of the medieval period. It was the doctrine of the universities, which were founded by the church. It mixed what we would divide today. We divide it into science and philosophy and theology. And this produced a human wisdom, something softer and more human than our science. An example of speculative philosophy would be that if you look up at the night sky, of course you see the object of astronomy, the, the science of studying the stars. But the scholastics would notice that it seemed pure and beautiful and it was absolutely regular. It obeyed clear laws and always did the same thing. Therefore, they speculated that it was a different sort of matter, a purer and better sort of matter than we have down here on Earth, which has all the opposite qualities. It's random, it's corruptible. Nothing seems to happen the same way twice. So it was speculative because it tried to understand the human importance. And of course, it was very important to religion because it seemed you could look up at the sky at night and see with the evidence of your own eyes, heaven. And so this confirmed religious teaching, and therefore it was a thing that the church wanted to protect against doubters such as Descartes, who, as we saw in part five, had the opposite point of view. The matter in the heavens is just the same as the matter down here on earth, and it doesn't teach you any lesson about purity or heaven or corruption. This passage concerns the way we should seek to know things, what kind of knowledge science looks for. It should look for the kind that skilled artisans have, that is, skilled workers. It shouldn't look for the kind that poets or religious seekers have. An artisan such as a potter knows all about clay and knows what kind can be made into a rough water jug and what kind will make a delicate teacup. And we should do abstract science, physics, in order to know the same things. What are the capabilities of matter and how do you make it work? We shouldn't look for the kind of knowledge that a poet is trying to get when the poet studies a flower or that the religious person is trying to get when she studies the life of a saint. Now, I'm going to talk about this passage, but I am half aware that it might be better just for me to shut up and let you read it and take it in for yourselves. But here goes. It 
clearly shows the character of Descartes and his mind and his project, all of the pride and daring and audacity of what he wants to do is right here on display. What is the result of us having practical rather than speculative knowledge about the world? Well, we make ourselves masters. We own it and it serves us. Anybody who might have been attracted to the attempt I made uh, a minute or two ago to explain what the religious counter-argument to Descartes might be, will probably appreciate this passage. This, as it seems to me, is a clear division in life. What should we think when we look at nature? Should it lead us upward to the idea that God owns us and we must hold our pride in and be humble? Or should it be that we ought to own it? It does seem to me that life forces you to go one way or another, and we're trying to understand why Descartes went his way. And these are the stakes. If you are humble before nature, if you respect it, then you cannot command it, and it will make you its slave. You will have to work so hard to get the basic things you need because you haven't got any proper tools to get things done that you might as well be in jail. Along with freedom from labor, we can develop medicine. There is no effective medicine in Descartes' day. And as we know, health is a fundamental good that makes everything else in life better. Oh, Descartes was one of a few early modern philosophers who had a, a personal loss due to disease. He had a daughter who died when she was five years old, and Descartes never really got over his grief of losing his child. Now, I'm only guessing here, but I think Descartes was angry, not so much at the disease, but at the society that wouldn't let him study ways to prevent such problems in the future. The human race was not allowed to organize itself to fight back. So to make some summary of the text we have been reading, Descartes was looking for the true human charity and the true human goodness which for him depended on knowing how to do good things for other people. And he thought that would come from having a practical attitude toward nature. You have to be willing to command it, which means you don't have an overwhelming respect for it. You have to be willing to command it or else you won't know how to make it do the things that you and other people need done. Now, the traditional charity depends on selflessness. You have to die to yourself, your own interests, your own desires, and do what's best for others. But Descartes seemed to think that this was not helpful the mere willingness to do what's good for others was not helpful if you didn't know how to be helpful. On the other hand, his view allows you to fulfill yourself through science, which is satisfying and rewarding, at least for the right sort of person. You could fulfill yourself rather than dying to yourself. And in the process, spread good things to all people around you and therefore be the truly good and truly charitable person.